when European explorers first arrived in North America, the Cherokee people inhabited a large part of the Southeast, including land that is now part of Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, and the Carolinas. Tribal history claims that the Cherokee have existed there since time began, and in the grand scheme of things it would certainly seem so, as anthropologists believe the tribe migrated south from the Great Lakes region approximately 4,000 years ago. As early as 1725, the Cherokee were recognized as a sovereign nation by the British, and their land was protected from encroachment by the proclamation of 1763. But following the revolution, the fledgling United States was hungry for Western expansion, and tribes like the Cherokee were targeted for their vast holdings. Early presidents like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams recognized some native rights, but still believe that they should exchange their ancestral home for areas west of the Mississippi that the U.S. had recently acquired in the Louisiana Purchase. Unfortunately, this concept of a peaceful transaction proved nothing more than wishful thinking, and by 1814, Major General Andrew Jackson led approximately 7,000 men into battle with a faction of the Creek Nation, resulting in a coercive treaty that forced the Creeks to cede 22 million acres of land to the United States. This, of course, put pressure on the other of the five remaining Indian nations, which included the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminoles, forcing them to acknowledge that they had no chance of protecting themselves from the United States military, and their only hope to resist must be nonviolent. So the Cherokee adopted parts of the American culture, engaging in Western education, converting to Christianity, and some even went so far as to build plantations on the backs of enslaved Africans. But none of this stopped what seemed inevitable. By 1835, the Cherokee had lost all but a small area of their land through a number of one-sided treaties. So a small group of Cherokee leaders gave in to the United States and signed the Treaty of New Echota, ceding all that was left of their ancestral home. Principal Chief John Ross urged the Cherokee people to stay and attempted to use the American legal system to avoid the treaty that he himself did not sign. But the damage had already been done, and the Cherokee were given two years to migrate voluntarily. But 16,000 Cherokee still refused to do so. So in 1838, the United States military arrived with 7,000 men to round up the Cherokee people and force them to undertake a brutal seven-month journey known as the Trail of Tears, a now infamous stain on American history in which 4,000 Cherokee people died from the treacherous journey. White settlers, cotton planters, and land speculators were not concerned with the hefty price that the Cherokee had to pay for their new fortune. However, the vicious legacy of what had been done has certainly lived on in some of the stories that continue to be told. Stories that acknowledge that this land would never truly be theirs. One such tale can be found in Adairsville, Georgia, just south of New Echota, the one-time capital of the Cherokee Nation. There, the ruins of a mansion built by a rich cotton planter remain today, an estate that many believe has been cursed for being built on the sacred ancestral grounds of the Cherokee people. It is known as Barnsley Gardens, and according to some, the spirits of the family who once lived there may still remain.
My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Godfrey Barnsley was one of the wealthiest cotton merchants in the antebellum South. At the age of 18, he came to the United States from England and settled in Savannah, where he not only made his fortune, but also met his wife, Julia Scarborough, the daughter of a well-established Southern family. The pair married on December 24, 1828, and in less than three years, their first of eight children was born. Then, in 1837, Barnsley purchased 3,645 acres of land in Adairsville, Georgia, and began making plans to build a grand mansion for his growing family. The home was to be called the Woodlands, but tragically, his wife Julia never saw its completion. Legend says that sometime after purchasing the property, Barnsley discovered that an old Cherokee man was still living on it. Some say he was a tribal elder, others that he was a chieftain, but either way he had refused to leave with his fellow tribesmen and somehow evaded detection from the military. Rather unexpectedly, Barnsley made friends with the old Cherokee and eventually shared with him the plans for his new home informing the man that his new mansion would sit atop a small acorn-shaped knoll or hill and overlook the small spring and creek. Upon hearing this, the Cherokee's demeanor changed rather quickly. This unique spot was sacred to his people. He warned Godfrey Barnsley not to proceed and told him that if he desecrated this hallowed ground he would most certainly face the wrath of the Cherokee's ancestors. But Barnsley did not listen, so the man placed a curse upon his family and was never seen again. In 1841, Godfrey and Julia moved their family into a small cabin on the property where they planned to live until the construction of their mansion was complete. The children enjoyed living there, but it is said that Julia became weary rather quickly, claiming that she felt a constant sense of uneasiness, which grew deeper and darker with every tree felled on sight. Some say that Julia begged her husband to find a new location for their home, but once again, he refused and construction began in the summer of 1844. Disturbingly, Julia's intuition proved right, and soon enough, she fell fatally ill from what was likely tuberculosis, but at the time was diagnosed as a lung infection. So Julia Barnsley died at the age of 34, leaving Godfrey heartbroken. But if this wasn't bad enough, Their infant son passed away not long after. Now, either stricken with grief, or possibly even taking the old Cherokee man seriously, Barnsley stopped construction on their dream home, and in an effort to escape the darkness, he packed up his children and moved to New Orleans, where he threw himself into his work. But eventually, after his pain had subsided, the family returned to Georgia, It was then that Godfrey Barnsley came face to face with the spirit of his late wife, and it's said that this apparition begged him to complete the woodlands and make it a proper home for their children. So he did.
progress was slow. Since Godfrey now saw the estate as a memorial to Julia, he became extremely particular in perfecting each and every detail and spared no expense commissioning items from Europe. The 14-room mansion was created in the style of an Italian villa and believed to have been influenced by the designs of Andrew Jackson Downing, the founder of American landscape architecture. And of course, every feature was considered cutting edge, and it even included what was considered modern plumbing, with hot and cold running water and flushing toilets. It's unknown exactly when it was completed, but by 1848, the Barnsley family were able to move in. Unfortunately, the tragedies that they would experience were far from over. In 1857, Barnsley's daughter Adelaide married John K. Reed of New Orleans. A year later, the pair arrived at the Woodlands to await their first child, but Adelaide did not survive childbirth and died in the home. Then, when the Civil War commenced five years later, the combination of Barnsley's age and the retention of his British citizenship exempted him from being called into military service. His sons, Lucian and George, however, eagerly enlisted in the Confederate Army. Fortunately, they survived. However, in 1862, George's eldest son, Harold, was said to have been killed in Shanghai by, quote, Chinese pirates. Harold had been an adventurer, and it is unclear exactly when he left the United States to journey east, but he was never heard from again. Some claim the young man was on a mission to locate exotic plants for his father, although this claim has no real basis in fact. Then, in May of 1864, the war arrived in Adairsville. Confederate Colonel Richard G. Earle of the 2nd Alabama Light Cavalry broke ranks to warn his friend Godfrey Barnsley that troops were approaching the woodlands. But the colonel did not make it. He was killed by a U.S. Army sharpshooter. Ultimately, the message was delivered, and out of respect for his fallen friend, Barnsley buried Earl in a grave near the kitchen wing of the house, supposedly not far from where he fell. At the time, the grave was marked with a stone, but it was later carved to identify his name and rank. It is said that after the war, members of Earl's family came to the woodlands with the intention of bringing his body back to Alabama. However, upon their arrival, they found no one willing to assist them with an exhumation because by then, the supposed curse on the estate had become well known and locals were afraid to interfere. The Earl family therefore had no other option but to leave the grave undisturbed and return home without their beloved. After the death of Colonel Earl and the Battle of Adairsville, the Woodlands was treated just like many other southern mansions and was ransacked by federal troops. Finding no gold or great treasures, the soldiers destroyed as much as they could, slashing paintings from frames, breaking statuaries, smashing the crystal in China, and of course, helping themselves to Barnsley's fine wines and brandies. By the end of the war, Barnsley had lost everything. His fortune and business was built on enslaved labor, his home had been vandalized, and his once beautiful gardens were now trampled. In addition, his two sons who had fought for the Confederacy now refused to make the oath of allegiance to the United States. So rather than returning, they set sail for South America and eventually settled in Brazil, where they began their own families. In an effort to regain even the smallest amount of his fortune, Godfrey Barnsley moved to New Orleans. Upon his departure to New Orleans, Godfrey Barnsley left control of the woodlands to his youngest daughter, Julia's husband, James Peter Baltzy. Baltzy had hoped to support the estate and possibly even his father-in-law by selling timber from the property. But in 1868, he was struck and killed by a falling tree. 
Now widowed, Julia and her daughter Adelaide joined her father in New Orleans. There, she met a German ship captain named Charles Henry von Schwartz, fell in love, and married once again. Then, on June 7, 1873, Godfrey Barnsley, the man who was once one of the wealthiest cotton merchants in the South, died with almost nothing to his name. Julia and Charles then took their family to the woodlands and buried Barnsley on the grounds of the estate. It is said that mourners at the funeral had remarked that it was the first time Godfrey Barnsley had been truly at rest since his beloved wife Julia died nearly three decades before. The family then split their time between New Orleans and Georgia until Julia was widowed once again. With nowhere to go, she and her daughter moved into the woodlands permanently, and she remained there until her own death in 1899. said that Julia frequently spoke of the grandeur of the estate during her childhood, and having heard such stories all of her life, Julia's daughter, Addie, became determined to restore her grandfather's mansion to its rightful prestige. But this turned out to be quite difficult. When Addie married, her young family chose to stay in the mansion and eventually they welcomed two sons. But like many who had lived and loved at the woodlands, she too experienced heartbreak as her husband died on the estate while the children were still young. Eerily, these young men would also seemingly be touched by the curse. In 1935, Addie's now adult sons, Preston and Harry, got into an incredibly heated argument. So Preston pulled a gun on his brother and shot him Harry died in his mother's arms soon after, in the main room of the estate's kitchen wing. As for Preston, he admitted to the murder and was sent to prison. Adelaide remained alone in the home for another seven years, until her death in 1942. And it was said that through all of the tragedies and setbacks she experienced, including a tornado in 1906, She not once relinquished the dream of restoring the home that her grandfather had built. But ultimately, the home had gradually fallen further and further into ruin during her time there. Following Adelaide's death, the crumbling estate was sold at auction and the land was used for farming while the mansion continued to decay, empty and forgotten. It is said that Addie was the first to experience paranormal activity on the property and that she purportedly became aware of the curse by hearing stories from both the neighbors and the men her grandfather had once enslaved there. Some of these stories claim that the apparitions of her grandparents were often seen walking through the garden. Others that Colonel Earl still roamed the estate, homesick for Alabama. but Addie never spotted Godfrey, only the grandmother whom she'd never met, although she did claim to hear the disembodied sounds of the old man shuffling around in the library, pouring himself a drink as he did in life. It was also said that she sometimes heard the laughter of children at play in the abandoned wing of the home and was even awakened from time to time by the sounds of hammers and workmen. Some claim that a Cherokee chief was once asked to visit the property in an effort to cleanse the land and prevent future tragedies. Depending on who tells the tale, he was either successful or arrived to find the curse had already been lifted when the man who placed it upon the family had died. Either way, visitors to what now remains of the Barnsley estate still claim that the grounds are haunted. At 
after several decades of decay, Barnsley Gardens was given new life in 1988, when a Bavarian prince purchased it and began a major project to stabilize the ruins and restore the gardens. It was discovered that the original boxwood hedges, planted in the early 1840s, had survived, and over the following years they were carefully cut back to reveal the original interweaving paths and flower bed of the oval parterre garden. As a result, Barnsley Gardens is now one of the few surviving antebellum gardens in the southern United States. Today, the property that was once called the Woodlands is a luxury resort park, aptly named Barnsley Resort. And while the home remains in ruins, the kitchen wing serves as a museum open to visitors. Yet despite the modern accommodations and plentiful activities, the tragedy and pain that once haunted the Barnsley family remain firmly entrenched not only in the crumbling brick ruins, but also in the continued sightings of Godfrey and Julia, walking through their gardens hand in hand, as they were never able to in life. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast written and produced by Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Not only will you help us sustain our growth and continue releasing episodes like this one, but you'll receive access to special members-only content and swag. The link is in the show notes. Lucky Lady Shacks.